Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. If you love these watches, reach out to me, because everything is for sale. Tmaso at thewatchbox.com is my email for all your questions about the prices of the watches in the show. So reach out to me to buy, trade, or sell, because we're always looking to build inventory. We love to take trades, and we pay cash, we pay fast, we buy watches outright. And we have no upper limit on value paid. We will buy your entire collection of Patek Philippe Tourbillon complications. So to buy, trade, or sell, reach out to me personally, tmaso at thewatchbox.com. Okay, so for 2023, we're now celebrating 60 years of the Rolex Daytona, and the new 126-500LN looks exactly like the watch I have right here. This is the 116-500LN. What are the big changes with the latest generation of the watch? Almost nothing, unless you're buying the Platinum Daytona, which now has a display case back. The standard steel watch is almost completely unchanged, which is why I've often said the Daytona, even compared to the Datejusts, the GMTs, and the Submariners, is the most evergreen design in the Rolex catalog. Externally, the one big change that we've seen since 1988 has been this ceramic bezel that arrived on the steel model in 2016. Other than that, ageless. And you can see why. It's a very versatile watch, 40 millimeters in diameter, no super case here, only 12.4 millimeters thick, beautifully graceful and versatile. On my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, you can see this is perfectly acceptable as either a sports watch or a dress watch, also for men or women. It slides easily underneath the cuff, it hugs the wrist, and it's got a wonderfully low profile. Again, not a whole lot has changed with the latest reference, which is why this watch still looks so current and will continue to do so. Even compared to the original Rolex Daytona of 1963, the family resemblance is striking. And internally, you've got a lot to love. This is a very versatile watch. As you can see, fully loomed with Rolex's signature chromolite blue loom, which they make in-house. We have a dial that is a sort of panda with black registers and a white lacquered base. This seems to be the dial that fans of the watch prefer, as these are generally higher priced on the aftermarket. I like the black dial, but the people have spoken, and this is the favorite. Now, it's all 100 meters water resistant, inside shock resistant, hugely anti-magnetic, three-day power reserve, automatic winding. We have a chronograph with a super crisp column wheel action and the smoothness of a vertical clutch. This is a watch that features a lot of details that matter. See the clasp mechanism? It's a spring-loaded beacon hook. You have two different latches. One is this lip lock system. The second is the clamshell. Pop it all open. That's a lot of security, by the way. We have a five millimeter tool-free adjustment in the clasp. Easy link, snap in, snap out. No tools necessary to size the watch. The timepiece is a lush and lovely stainless steel with black ceramic scratch resistant bezel. And then we have a trip lock crown. Fun fact, if you haven't seen this before, Rolex crowns always have a symbol that lets you know the material and whether the crown is a twin lock or trip lock. Three symmetrical dots means trip lock in steel. So that is the Rolex Daytona, a lovely piece and ageless, the Porsche 911 of sports watches. Now let's bring in something extremely different. Okay, back in 2012 when this Zenith El Primero Espada launched, jean frederic Dufour was at the peak of his powers as the CEO of Zenith rehabilitating the company in the wake of the traumatic upheaval of the Terry Nataf years. And Dufour focused on simplicity and classical beauty. However, he was also willing to try new things, which is why here we have the El Primero Espada, a 40 millimeter all-arounder comparable to a Rolex Datejust 41. This is an El Primero without the chronograph mechanism, so still 36,000 vibrations per hour and automatic. But as you can see on the reverse side, this unique caliber 4650 is an El Primero without the chronograph bridges, the column wheel, and all the thickness that comes with it. Still 50 hour power reserve and Surprisingly, this watch, though it's somewhat formal, it's an all-arounder. It's designed to be worn full-time dress and sports attire. It is a screw-down crown with 100 meters of water resistance, which means it's got quite a lot of resilience and you can absolutely swim in it. The watch has a wonderfully chunky quick-set mechanism that is one of the loudest and crispest I've ever encountered. This watch, in all its forms, super rare. Most were made in steel. Of those made in rose gold, most were made with a strap. 
The rarest version of the Espada is the one you see right here, rose gold on a full factory bracelet, and it wears beautifully. Just like the Daytona, this is a timepiece for men and women, and it's a timepiece that you can wear in the swimming pool, the pool hall, the restaurant, the bedroom, the boardroom. This is a watch that goes everywhere, and a really lovely example of Zenith at its best. On the strength of watch designs like this and the rehabilitation of the manufacturer, J.F. Dufour became the CEO of Rolex, and you can see why they admired his handiwork. We have a tobacco brown metallic sunburst style with lovely satinated and polished applique hour indices and plenty of luminescence. So automatic, full bracelet, 100 meters water resistant and well loomed. You could even argue that this is a form of sports watch. That said, personally, I prefer dress watches and I love dress watch complications. And here is a great example. In 2021, Arnold and Son of La Chaux de Fonds, which is the brand associated with the manufacturer La Chaux Pere, Arnold and Son launched the Luna Magna. And later that year, they launched this, the 28 piece Luna Magna in platinum. Get a nice focus here, zoom in. So the case 44 millimeters, but with super short cropped and downturned welded on lugs, beautifully handcrafted and surprisingly easy to wear for a 44, a dramatically domed and cambered sapphire. Really the most dramatically domed, you'll see this side of an HYT or a quorum bubble. The dial, well, the dial proper is mother of pearl. And then behind that, we have a venturine glass. And then we have a spherical 12 millimeter globe. This is a bi-directionally quick settable moon phase that has an adjustment interval of one correction every 122 years. One side is gray marble, the other side is a venturine. Manual wind, the watch has a 90 hour power reserve. On the back, you can see there's a little tool to allow you to more easily set the moon phase precisely. And then it is beautifully decorated with Cote de Soleil sunburst stripes across the bridges. Satination on the wheels, as well as on this click and click spring assembly, both beautiful. You can see the crown wheel center, the crown wheel core has been solarized. And then we have uh, bevels a mile wide and beautiful glinting gleaming inside the wheels as well as on the edge of the bridges. Uh, 21 six beat rate, a lovely timepiece. Again, a 28 piece limited edition. You can see this is 15 of 28 in platinum. And I mentioned it's a remarkably wearable 44 millimeter watch. And I plan to back that up right here by showing you how it wears on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, the, the lugs are not over the edge and you can see that on both sides. So even if your wrist is my size, heck, even if your wrist is 15 centimeters circumference, you're gonna be able to wear this beauty and you will never see another one. Speaking of never seeing another one, that's a 28 piece edition. This is 10. This is a 2023 10 piece limited edition from H. Moser and C. This is the Endeavor Perpetual Calendar Tantalum USA limited edition. The USA edition was built 10 pieces in jade, well that is jade dial, and 10 pieces with a lapis lazuli dial. This one is my preference, this is the lapis. So 42 millimeter tantalum case, a lapis lazuli dial, a 10 piece edition. We have an Andrea Streller designed bi-directional perpetual calendar. See the way this works? You have this little stub index at center, 12 hours, 12 months. That's how it indicates the month. You can turn the calendar forward or backwards. By the way, in case you're wondering, it always jumps from 28 to one and vice versa. Uh, in most cases, you're gonna see that kind of a jump. And that's why sometimes when you initially jump manually, you see 28, not 31 or 30. But the watch, bi-directionally settable with a perpetual calendar, has a little leap year phase indicator on the back. And so this system allows you to set the leap year and then disappear it when you don't need it. There's a power, let me, may as well pull this out. There's a power reserve indicator over at nine o'clock. Seven days is the rated power reserve, but in fact, it'll run for almost nine. The watch features a hacking seconds function. If you wish, you can stop the seconds hand and set it to a reference time. Being a perpetual calendar, you have the ability to jump over irregular length months and leap years. The watch knows the difference between them. And so you can, always count on the calendar being true. Turning it all over, you can see the HMC 800 movement, two barrels in golden chiton. You can see golden chiton as the cups holding the jewels. This is a nod to the way watches were built in the pocket watch era. This entire escapement and balance assembly lifts out as a unit to be replaced with a pre-serviced unit when the watch goes in for service. It beats away at 18,000 vibrations per hour. It has a solid gold escapement, 14 carat. 
a mechanical grade of gold that is super low friction. And you can see we have two hairsprings, 180 degrees opposed, identical flat hairsprings. In any position, one will cause the watch to run slow, the other by an equal and opposite margin will cause the watch to run fast. So in any position, they cancel out the effects of gravity instantaneously. Now there is an abyss enamel dial version of this watch in the tantalum case, but what that watch does not have that the USA limited edition does have, look carefully, you can see the capstone on the balance on the 10 piece limited edition is a brilliant cut diamond. Super cool. This is my favorite Moser of all time and the one I most want to own. Also, it's remarkably short across the wrist. It's only 48.5 millimeters from lug to lug, so it's a lot more compact than you'd expect for a 42. It's also surprisingly thin and only 13.5 millimeters thick. You can see how fluid and beautiful that tantalum case is. It has dips, swells, creases, curves, satin, and polish. Even the case back is contoured, and this case back sapphire is cambered to trace the arc of your wrist. This is my favorite watch in today's show. It's not the last watch. I always save the last and most spectacular watch for the end, but this is my favorite. Now, here's a watch that is fun and yet accessible. From Tag Heuer, this is the Carrera Caliber 5 Muhammad Ali. Now, of course, Muhammad Ali, famed American heavyweight champion and activist, he had a 750-piece limited edition that came out in 2016. This is the 2017 edition because of Ali's spiritual connections to the Middle East. A special Middle East-only edition of this watch was created that replaced the dial of the prior model with a new Eastern Arabic dial. And you can see we have a bi-directional rotating bezel that features Eastern Arabic numerals representing the 15 rounds of a regulation boxing match. You've got Ali's signature. The watch is 43 millimeters in diameter. You can see what makes a Carrera is not the chronograph status, it's these angular lugs and they're well represented. On the reverse side, we have the image of Muhammad Ali in his prime. And then a note, this is 100 meters water resistance on a different kind of strap. You could go swimming with it. Inside, caliber 5, which is an ETA 28242, automatic winding, quick set, hacking second, very, very tough, 38-hour power reserve. And you can see that it's a very sporting look. It's a tritone of red, black, and white, which is often seen on sporting chronographs, generally from the 60s and the 70s period. We have a 70s style perforated leather strap. On the bottom, the strap is actually inlaid with red rubber so that the moisture, sweat, heat, oil, and grit of the wrist won't prematurely age the strap. So a fun piece, but you've got to kind of be a big guy. Muhammad Ali was six foot three, so he could have worn this. My 16 centimeter circumference wrist can't quite accommodate. But if your wrist is 17 and up, game on. Here we have two fun pieces from Patek Philippe, and I guess this, this is the classical beauty. This is going to be the crowd pleaser for traditionalists, because we have a set of Breguet Arabic numerals on a Patek Philippe calendar watch. This is the 5396R012. This is a model that originally came out in 2006, and the watch is very simple and enduring for a reason. 38 millimeters is the perfect size. And with an array of different strap, dial, and case combinations, it has been a remarkably long-legged reference. It looks as good today as it did the day it debuted. Now we have an annual calendar, day, date, month, moon phase, and then a 24-hour dial coaxial with the moon phase. So you know, for example, whether you're looking at 10 p.m. or 10 a.m., you can see that that little hand is sticking up at 22, so that means 10 p.m., so you know not to use the pusher adjusters to set the calendar. Patek Philippe invented the annual calendar, launching their original 5035 back in 1996. The annual calendar only needs one adjustment per year, once annually, during the jump from February to March. Turn it all over. And we have the Caliber 324 automatic with a 45-hour power reserve, six-position adjustment, Gyromax free-sprung balance, a Spiromax, anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, and with the Patek Philippe seal, all these features come together to give the watch a factory accuracy rating of no worse than minus three plus two seconds per day. You can also see that the movement, which features a judicious blend of hand and mechanical finishing, goes heavier on the hand finishing element than some others like JLC, Audemars Piguet, and FP Journ. So this is still an extensively and beautifully hand finished movement. In fact, I would say as people have become more accustomed to examine their case backs up close, Patek has even improved its finish compared to where it was in the 90s and the early 2000s. Particularly the quality of the bevels has improved immensely. 
on the wrist. It's beautiful and it's nicely sized. A strong candidate to be your dress watch and your daily. The rose gold melds beautifully with the silver white opaline dial and those matching rose gold faceted dauphine hands and breguet Arabic numerals. Now, if you want something a little bit sporty or a little bit more complicated, certainly a little bit bigger, we have here the original circa 2006 variant of the 5960. This is the 5960P-001. Now, this launched the first ever Patek Philippe manufacture automatic chronograph caliber. And so this is the 28520. Prior to this, Patek had never made an automatic chronograph caliber. So this debuted that movement alongside the Nautilus Chrono, but the Nautilus Chrono doesn't have this watch's power reserve indicator and annual calendar. So here we have a day, date, month, American format annual calendar. Underneath that, a little power reserve indicator, 55 hours of power reserve. You can wind it manually. It's also a rotor automatic. We have a mono counter down at six o'clock with coaxial chronograph hours and minutes to keep the dial clean and symmetrical. We have leaf style hands and indices and date frame in white gold. There's a little AM PM indicator there. You can see how that is blue. That lets you know that you're in the nighttime hours. That is the time when you don't want to use the correctors to change the calendar system. Now, when that aperture is white, you're in the clear. Then you can use the calendars to make corrections. It's not just a chronograph. It is a flyback chronograph. So reset and restart with one push of the chronograph trigger. 40.5 millimeters in diameter in platinum. You know, it's a modern platinum Patek Philippe because it has that little top Vesselton diamond between the lugs. We have an ardoise or anthracite metallic sunburst dial and surprisingly for a dress watch we have plenty of loom the movement is free sprung with a column wheel and vertical clutch for the chronograph and the vertical clutch allows you if you wish to leave the chronograph running full time with no additional hazard wear or tear to the watch because you'll note when the chrono's not running here it's a relatively still dial a lot of folks like to see some movement which is why you can leave this chrono running again the vertical clutch makes that possible on the reverse side you can see the movement is beautiful it's also a very early example including two features that i consider essential this is an awesome combo a lot of folks don't realize that the earliest versions of this watch featured handmade breguet overcoil hair springs and that's what we have here Later on, a machine-made and much cheaper silicon hairspring replaced that. This has the original metallic breguet. We also have the Geneva Hallmark. That went away after about July of 2009 when the Patek Philippe seal replaced it. The quality of the finishing didn't change, but I like the older, more nostalgic. And, of course, we have a rather unconventional type of column wheel here, but it's a very crisp-feeling one. And then again, all of this adjusted in a high horology style and chronometer style five positions includes a full deployment clasp this is a tremendously everyday friendly watch it's broad at about 49 millimeters lug to lug so you need a wrist of about my size or larger to wear it but it wears beautifully and Patek pairs down some of the visual mass with a concave bezel really one of the company's all-time greatest hits and probably the most iconic Patek Philippe from the 2000s alongside the 5711 there's really no other company competition for that status. The two watches that came out during that period that really defined the era, the 5960 and the 5711, and this, the earliest version of the 5960. Believe it or not, this is the penultimate watch, not the ultimate watch. So you're probably wondering, Tim, what's more spectacular than a Royal Oak Jumbo Skeleton Perpetual Calendar? And you'll find out, but make no mistake, this 25829 is a monster. 39 millimeters in diameter in yellow gold. It uses the original Jumbo case construction with a monoblock case that is the mid case and the case back made all in one piece. And you can see it's a front loader with a little slot adjacent to the stem, the dial and the move movement load through the front and then the bezel comes on. You can see the contrast between the white gold of the bezel bolts and the yellow gold of the bezel. On the dial, we have under the primary sapphire, a second sapphire that acts as the platform for the printed day, date, month leap year, and moon phase. And you can see they even gave us a northern and southern hemisphere moon phase for good measure. Underneath, you could see the combination of the 2120 and 2800 module. The 2800 module is a perpetual calendar. You can see its wheels, its springs. Uh, there's even a star wheel jumper over on the day register. 
It is beautifully executed, and you can even see the engraving, the base caliber beneath that. Oh, and I do mean the engraving. By the way, the tolerance of the bracelet, outstanding. You can even see that it's a very, very old school AP bracelet with a stamped clasp made of white gold, a mechanical grade gold. White gold is the hardest of golds, which is why it's often used for clasps. This is old school AP, back when they really sweated details. You can see the serial number, as well as Contien Perpetuel Automatique and the name of the company. All of this engraved by hand. The 2120 base has been extravagantly skeletonized and engraved. Every surface has a bevel on each side. We've got interior angles, exterior points, engraving on components that are barely there to begin with, black polished screws, an open barrel, an elaborately engraved AP logo style rotor that sits on a beryllium ring because this movement is based on the JLC 920 Abouche, created in 1967 and commissioned by AP Patek Philippe, and Vacheron. It was a Holy Trinity movement only ever used by the Holy Trinity, and in the modern era, Audemars Piguet has built and finished it in-house. Now, AP is phasing out the use of this movement, which is why it's all the more important to treasure the examples that have been made. You can also see that this watch features a free-sprung gyromax-style balance. This model, though it has a C serial number, is a 1990s reference, as Audemars Piguet reckons that between 1984 and 1995, it was actively still using the C serial number. A lot of folks accidentally placed the C series exclusively in the 1980s. The fact is it was also used right up until the mid-90s, which is why this watch is a 90s free-sprung reference though it has a C serial number in the 82,000 range. This is the AP you imagine in your dreams and it's the AP that is increasingly rare in the real world, at least in the current catalog. Beautifully finished and nicely preserved. You can see how well it fits on my wrist. You can also see the sharpness of the bezel and the lug profiles, indicating a large amount of the original gold is still intact. The watch is super slim, and as you can see, it slides easily underneath a dress cuff. It is a sporty dress watch. A sporty dress complication is how I would sum this up. I do think a yellow gold jumbo with the skeleton perpetual calendar is more dressy than sporty, and you certainly don't want to swim with it, but this is a watch that if you have the panache, you can wear just about all occasions that don't require high impact or waterproofness. Now, what could possibly be more spectacular than that to conclude the show? Well, why don't we stick with skeletonization and engraving from a perpetual calendar in gold? I will raise you a tourbillon in platinum. This is the Breguet Classic Tourbillon 3355PT, and it is the best of everything. Let's get a little bit closer. First, the case. Cold rolled and hand-finished coining in profile. The lugs welded on manually. The dial, both the seconds track and the hour and minute ring, engraved and carved from the solid gold and then silvered. The tourbillon, free sprung, tri spoke seconds, one minute period, overcoil hairspring, breguet, of course. This is the 558 SQ1 caliber based on the Lamagna tourbillon design that Daniel Roth created in the 80s. So this is a Daniel Roth movement at heart. Of course, Lamagna and Breguet were sold together, which is why this movement finds its way into this watch. And again, 36 millimeters in diameter. The barrel is open. You can see the coiled mainspring. You can see the keyless works, the engagement of the winding pinion, the engagement of the crown wheel, the engagement of the motion works with the minute wheel driving the hour wheel by the minute wheel pinion. This watch, not just skeletonized, engraved, elaborately finished, beveled on the edge of every bridge, which has been reduced to the quintessence of dust. You can even see that the hour wheel itself has been engraved. Flip it all over, manual wind, 50 hour power reserve. You can see the reverse is even more elaborately engraved and skeletonized. And anyone can wear this watch with no doubts about its fit. All of the screw heads are black polished. There's slots and circumference chamfered. Everything here represents the finest that one of the finest brands in history has been able to accomplish. And it comes with a full matching platinum clasp. A lot of folks ask me, Tim, where I can get the best value in high horology? And they expect me to say Holy Trinity, Longa, maybe some chic independent. But what I'll always say is look at Breguet. 
because a lot of folks hold it against the company that it's owned by a luxury group or that it's poorly marketed or that the Breguet family is no longer involved in making the watches. Well, true fact, no Pateks or Philippes are involved in making those watches. No Long or Heine still works at Long und Heine. And there are no Gégers or Lecoultes at Gégers Lecoultes, but we respect all those brands immensely. We need to value Breguet for the people and the talent they do have today rather than lament the 19th century watchmakers who haven't been around to contribute. Trust me, if Abraham Louis Breguet were alive today, if he saw this, he would be impressed. Reach out to me, tmasso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details of any watch you see today.